Hey people, good morning or whatever the time is it. And my name is Dario and I'm here with Max. Hi Max, how do you do? Hello everyone, yeah, I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Well, well, uh, a little bit excited because it's my first time at KubeCon as speaker and also as attendee. And I'm really happy to be here with you because we are going to shoot with it with Capsule and it's really as astonishing. I'm really thrilled to be here and I'd like to thank all the people that is joining this session because we did a great job together as developers and also as architect of the software that we built. So, um, yeah. Uh, I'd like to show you how this presentation is made of. So uh, this is obviously the introduction and we are going to have two sessions because this is a presentation between me and Max and I'm going to introduce you what is Capsule because Capsule is an open source project and uh, it's able to provide a multi-tenancy. Also, it's the topic of this session. And after that, Max is going to share what they were able to achieve at wargaming.net with Capsule and he's going to share some really nice insights regarding the abilities of Capsule and the platform that they built. So I don't want to provide so much spoilers. So I can just suggest you to enjoy it and see you later for the last session. Bye bye. Goodbye and I hope you will be interested. Hi people. My name is Dario Tranchitella and I'm an open source software engineer at Classics, an Italian startup based in Italy with the mission of bringing Kubernetes everywhere. In this section, I'd like to introduce you to Capsule, the multi-tenancy operator. But first, I think I should give you a brief introduction about the multi-tenancy dilemma and the current state of multi-tenancy in Kubernetes itself and the ecosystem. Multi-tenancy is nothing new if you're already familiar with the Kubernetes. Um, the basic resources you're using is namespace, allowing you to group application into an application logical group. All the pods, deployments, services, ingresses, and so forth of each application, or maybe team in big corporations, is collected in namespaces. It's pretty easy to understand. This is common and best practice, dividing components and applications in several namespaces. But doing so doesn't mean you're adopting multi-tenancy. There are some aspects you have to consider since it's like the shared hosting in the mid to thousands. And I'm referring to the noisy neighbor effects. Um, we all know Kubernetes is great at crafting distributed systems and provides out of the box some resources that help you to tackle the downside of dealing with a multi-tenant environment. The resources I'm referring to are limit range, resource quota, and the well-known and famous network policy. I'm not going to do a one-on-one -on -one introduction about this because documentation is there for this kind of stuff, but I'm going to provide a brief overview since with the combination of these resources, you can achieve complex multi-tenant strategies. Um, said so, uh, limit range is the resource you have to use to set a minimum and or a maximum amount of resource requests, also known as CPU, memory and storage. These policies are useful to set the minimum amount a pod has to use, really useful when dealing with unconstrained containers that can lead to CPU throttling or out of memory of node, as well for the upper limit since few things are infinite. And resources pretty sure are not, except you are using a cloud provider and it's not your business. Anyway, following, <laughs> we got the resource quota. Um, this API allows you to specify some constraint policies for a specific set of resources. Uh, let's imagine that you have to limit the amount of PVC requested by a namespace, persistent volume claims. Um, this is the perfect use case, as well as limiting the amount of pods to avoid the container sprawl. And finally, the well-known network policy. I guess we all know them because it's used as a sort of firewall for the applications that we deploy in our clusters. So sometimes we are biased to consider them as a sort of security thing. And this is absolutely true though. However, um, network policy must be used to deny communication between services that don't belong to the same tenant for obvious reason, I'd say security in first place. Okay, great. Um, now we all know all the tools to build up your tenant platform, besides the downside that all these resources are namespaced scope. And it means that 
the enforcement of these policies is applied just to the namespace where the resource is living, and this doesn't apply well in a multi-tenant environment. But exactly how a tenant can be defined? Let's try to summarize how it can be interpreted properly in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And I think the most basic definition could be a collection of namespaces where each namespace is collecting the resources requested for a specific component or application owned by a team or a group of developers. And in the end, if you start thinking about if you are giving developers access to your Kubernetes clusters, you are just granting administrator capabilities to the namespace they have to manage and sometimes just in read-only mode. Um, working with multi-tenancy with just a team is pretty easy and straightforward. You prepare the environments, creating the namespaces, set the Kubernetes resources we presented early, and I'm referring to the limit range, enter policy, resource quota, and giving access to them. But dealing with this at scale could be a nightmare, and the automation must kick in for several reasons. Capsule is our non-opinionated solution to solve this situation. Um, you got a custom resource definition named tenant that assigns a namespace creation right to their owners. End of the story. What you just need to do is specifying all the business logic in the tenant manifest and the tenant owners can create on their own the namespaces that will be treated as a sort of single namespace, the tenant abstraction. But before proceeding with Capsule um, is capable of, I think it's better to explain how Capsule was born. And yeah, I still recall the first call uh, I had with Adriano, the Classix, the Classix founder, and he asked me directly, hey, do you want to deploy and develop a Kubernetes operator for the multi-tenancy? And my reply was even more direct. Why do we need yet another project to deal with this if there is Red Hat, OpenShift and Ranger doing this stuff? because multi-tenancy in Kubernetes is broken was his answer, a bold statement, yeah. But in the end, that's true, and it's the reason why we got several other projects that are trying to tackle this goal. And just, th just thinking about the hierarchical namespace controller by Google or the virtual cluster initiative, all these projects are living in the multi-tenancy special interest group. And I said earlier, that Kubernetes is great at designing distributed systems since it allows to just use the requested resources and components to build your infrastructure. It doesn't mean it's out of the box, you have to put in place on your own. And the same applies also for the multi-tenancy. And that's the reason why we started this lovely adventure together. At that time, Classics was doing scouting for one of its customers to provide a public container platform a sort of Heroku, but built on top of Kubernetes. If you prefer fancy names and acronyms, I think that NAAS is the right one, namespace as a service. And juxtaport, um, the prerequisite of the project was delivering a true and native Kubernetes experience to developers. No need to add further APIs, binaries to install, YAML definitions, and anything else that could puzzle their minds. The goal was Issue kubectl from your terminal, and there you go. And we started the project with this in mind. And after some time, we realized that we were building something really disrupting. Disrupting because I, wa I was working on it. Absolutely not. <laughs> but being non-opinionated on the multi-tenancy strategy provided, um, showed us that we were crafting a framework allowing any or most level of multi-tenancy. Obviously, um, starting from the public-facing scenario, the namespace as a service uh, one, helped us shaping in a smarter way the specification, but what changed our project and the project itself was the community. And I'm really honored to be on this stage with Max, although virtually, uh, since together we went further from the initial plan and this was the demonstration that the community is the real engine that helps you to delivering um, software solving people's problem. And that has been a crazy and emotional ride with all the people showing interest and the filing bug or feature request. But let's try to step down from the emotional talk and let's try to dr drill down the, cap the, cuba the capsule cuba uh, cap uh, capabilities. I don't want to let this talk uh, look uh, like a sales speech. So, um, okay, what are the capsule super capabilities? I'm trying to summarize in small and short sentences to leave enough room to Max's presentation that is absolutely stunning. Um, 
Okay, you can limit the namespaces that can be created by a tenant owner, really useful for the paper use scenario. Uh, you can specify which ingress or storage classes a tenant can use, as providing a tiring for the backing storage used by applications, or forcing to announce uh, applications using a specific load balancer. And since we are, we are talking about networking at ingress, you can put in place a policy for the allowed ingress host names as using a specific domain for the exposed applications. Or you could mitigate the CVE 2020-8554, enforcing a specific set of IP addresses or ranges that can be used by the, the service in the tenant. And also, from the security perspective, the container registry used by pods running in the tenant can be enforced as well as assigning additional role bindings to use pod security policies or maybe other CRDs. And last but not least, the automation for the most important resources in a multi-tenant environment. Enforcement of limit range, network policy and resource quota across all the namespaces of the tenant. And before proceeding to the final consideration, I'd like to talk a bit about the bring your own device capability. As with other resources, uh, Capsule has a reinvented wheel since it's using the pod node selector admission controller available in Kubernetes since the 1.5 release, if I recall correctly. Um, however, uh, when all these features kick in together, uh, you can achieve for real a bring your own device um, scenario because what you just need to, need to do is to spin up some worker nodes provisioned with a specific label, let them join the cluster and you can manage your reserved partitions of the cluster. And it's absolutely amazing since you are totally decreasing any side effect of a multi-tenant cluster. No noise enables your own resources. It's like being on a managed Kubernetes cluster, but owned by your organization. Anyway, I know what some of you started mumbling about. Mm. I can already do that on my own. I just need to write down the dynamic admission controls. And yeah, that's true, but there is something you have to consider, the declarative way, also known as the YAML. The tenant YAML definition, as you can see, uh, is easy to understand and easy to grok as any, any other resource in Kubernetes. But more, it allows to combine all these policies together that will require otherwise a big effort on wiring all the webhooks together and building a way to group together the namespaces in an abstraction, the tenant one. And keep a look to the node selector key. That's the keystone enabling the bring your own device scenario beside the provisioning process, though that is still required to be configured at node startup. Um, Trying to recap all the features, I'm pretty confident to say that Capsule can be considered as a sort of framework to build your own multi-tenancy solution without disrupting the developer experience that will enjoy a fully compatible API server, managing their resources using kubectl and without dealing with any complex CRDs since there is just the tenant one. And it's up to the cluster administrator to, do, to deal with it. And said so, yeah, I think I can pass the word to Max uh, that is going to show us what they were able to achieve with Capsule at Wargaming.net during the, their journey uh, on using Kubernetes at scale to avoid the famous cluster sprawl. So thank you so much and cheers. Hello everyone, as you maybe know, my name is Max Fedotov and I'm working as an infrastructure engineer in a maintenance department of Wargaming. In my part of talk, I would like to share with you how we were able to redesign our internal Kubernetes clusters with the help of the capsule, why we decided to adopt multi-tenancy, and which benefits we got from this decision. But before we start, I would like to tell a few words about Wargaming for those who are maybe not a big fans of video games. So, who we are? We are a global online game dev and publisher with over 220 millions of players who are enjoying our games on all major gaming platforms. And I think everyone had heard or maybe even played our flagship products like World of Tanks or World of Warships. And in my department, we are in charge of supporting all the infrastructure which is used in order to run these games. So what do we had before adopting Capsule? I think this, is the, this was the most classic on-premise setup that you can imagine. So you can find it at any Kubernetes guides. As we are operating in multiple regions, we provisioned a single Kubernetes cluster per region because it is much easier to manage and we were able to provide additional in-cluster services and integrations with our internal system like monitoring, logging, 
authentication and so on. We used shared nodes, a mix of hardware and VMs, and we created a separate namespace per customer, which are our internal development teams in order to provide type of isolation. We also used Calico global network policies for network isolation. And at the beginning, when we hadn't got a lot of customers, this setup was quite good for us. But things changed when clusters start to grow and we got more customers on board. So what was wrong? The first problem was that namespaces are too granular. Most of our customers needed more than a single namespace. They needed a namespace per project or namespace per application. So we had to manage a namespace provisioning for them, and we also managed access and permissions. Not provisioning was also on us, so we, had to do, so we had to do some type of capacity planning and management. And another problem was billing. So when you had shared nodes, you need to implement complex billing rules, and that's not easy at all, really. And also due to shared resources, it was very easy to get a noisy neighbor effect that Jaro already mentioned in his talk, when customer workloads began to interfere with each other. So you will ask me an obvious question. If the shared model was not so good for us, why not to use a cluster per customer? And that was one of our initial thoughts too. But in this scenario, there were also some disadvantages for us. The first one is that we have six regions of presence. So in reality, for each customer, we need to provision not a single cluster, but six clusters. So we multiplied the number of customers by number of regions and we understood that it will be too much really for us. So the maintenance cost for this solution will be quite high for. Another problem was that we had to support different versions of Kubernetes. Why? Because, you know, like it's always in a big companies, there is a customer A who wants to have the newest version, and there is a customer B who wants to have the more stable version. And that's a problem for us because we had different tools some of them were our internal tools, some were different open source operators that we installed in order to provide additional in-cluster services. And sometimes we even modified, forked them so they fit best for our environment. So we had to build and maintain a separate version for each tool, for each version of Kubernetes. And it may seem like not a big deal, but still, it adds something to maintenance cost too. Also, we were a bit afraid that when everyone will be sitting in their separate clusters, it will be hard to share some knowledge or services or ideas. So what we wanted to is that if one of our customers had adopted some new technology or had brought or implemented some operator, he should be able to provide this as a service to all other customers. So as a result, this separate cluster per customer approach seemed more like a Kubernetes as a service. And what we wanted to provide for our customers was a managed Kubernetes solution. So we understood that having a single cluster per region is the best model for us. And what we needed was to brought some advanced multi-tenancy capabilities to Kubernetes. So we wrote down some critical points that we wanted to have in our new cluster design. So the first one was that we wanted to have a bring your own device approach. So customer can bring his own hardware nodes or he can provision a VM in some of the cloud provider and his workloads will run only on these dedicated nodes. This also helped us to simplify billing as there is direct mapping with nodes and customer. We also wanted to have more self-service for customers so they can provision their own namespace if they manage access and permissions in them. So if it's possible, the best option for us would be that customers think that they're living in their own private cluster, while in reality they're located in a big shared Kubernetes cluster. And also important was to keep vanilla Kubernetes experience. So when our users are reading Kubernetes docs or they are reading some articles in the internet, they don't need to think if the thing they're reading, they reading about will work on our internal Kubernetes cluster. And as a good engineer, I've started Googling and reading about current situation with multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. And as Dario already mentioned in his talk, there are problems with multi-tenancy and I will definitely agree with him on this. But then I found Capsule and it was really a perfect fit for our demands. So we became one of the early Capsule adopters and soon it became a central component of our internal Kubernetes clusters. And what I really love about the capsule 
not saying about some technical details or technical part. It is its community and maintainers. So when you are adopting some new open source technology, you always found out some use cases in your environment uh, that are not already covered by it. So you need to add some functions, or maybe you even don't understand how better to use this new product. And Dara and other maintainers were always so helpful and they helped us not only with uh, uh, adopting it, but they also helped us to contribute different features. And I'm really very proud that now I'm also one of the Capsule maintainers too. So with the help of Capsule, we were able to formalize two core concepts that we are now using in our internal Kubernetes clusters. First one is tenant, it's our customer. So it has some name, a group of owners who had an admin privileges in the tenant, and a cost center, which is a label that we applied to tenants node as a tag, and then later we use it for billing, so we can directly send bills for, a, for our customers. Another one is a node group. It is a set of nodes with a common flavor that are created in one of the cloud providers, and they're always bound to, for some tenant. So you can think about it like a cloud agnostic abstraction of AWS after scaling groups or a Google Cloud after scaling node groups. A node group also had a name, which we apply as a label to all nodes, so our customers can use it later in label selectors. It is created in some of the cloud providers, and all nodes in the node group had the same common flavor. For node group, we also introduced a concept called role. It's some type of a predefined template. So for example, for ingress role, we install and configure an ingress controller on each of the nodes of the node group. And the last one is min node and max nodes. These are used in order to support auto-scaling. And we have a set of core components that we are using to, in order to implement this concept. First one is called Provisioner. It's our internal component, which is in charge of provisioning everything. So it subscribes using WebSockets to our internal configuration management databases, database, where information about tenants and non-groups is stored. And then it's managed tenants, ingress and storage classes provisioning, as well as not group provisioning in different cloud providers. So this is the core component that communicates with all cloud providers. Next one is Capsule. And the first thing that Capsule helps us is with implementing bring your own device approach. So when a node is registered in Kubernetes, we add a label with the name of the tenant on it. And then we use a Capsule node selector to ensure that tenants workloads will run only on dedicated tenant node groups. We were also able to get rid of a shared ingresses. When a customer creates a node group with ingress role, provisioning creates a dedicated ingress class for it. And then Capsule forces the application in the tenants to be published only by the assigned ingress controllers. Another feature that we get was additional source service abilities. So our customers are always mapped to a dedicated LDAP groups. And when a customer creates a tenant, we assign his group as a tenant owner. So they can manage everything inside their tenant without any need, without any help of the cluster administrators. And the last one is isolation. So Capsule had an ability to assign specific labels or annotations on tenant namespaces and tenant services. So namespace labels are used in order to achieve network isolation with Calico global network policies, and our tenants are always isolated from each other. And with the help of labels on services, we are able to make node ports to be opened only on the tenant nodes. And I will tell you about how we will be able to do this on the next. So a few words about node port and multi-tenancy. We are using Kuproxy in IP tables mode, and by default, it watches services and creates IP tables rules on all cluster nodes. And that is okay for cluster IP services, but how to deal with a node ports in a multi-tenant environment? So we forked Kuproxy and added additional configuration flag with the name of the tenant on whose node Kuproxy is running. And then we added additional label selector for the watch where this configuration flag is passed. So our Kuproxy, which is only for services located in the same tenant as Coop Proxy is. And now, node ports are opened only on the tenant nodes. Capsule Proxy is another member of Capsule ecosystem. 
It is a simple reverse proxy that intercepts specific requests to the API servers. So for now, nodes and namespaces and points are already in open source version of Capsule Proxy, and the last two, ingress classes and storage classes, are in our private fork, but we are going to contribute it soon. So Capsule Proxy modifies users' requests so they only see resources available in their tenant, and it provides users an experience that they're working in their own private cluster. And the last component we have is a tenant afterscaler. It is a forked version of cluster afterscaler, which watches for unschedulable pods only in the tenant namespaces. We, has also, we also had an implementation, a custom implementation of cloud provider interface for it. So instead of directly interacting with specific cloud providers, it talks to our provisioner. And that is the way that we are able to support nodes from different cloud providers in a single tenant. If we take a look from a user perspective, they are working with us the same way that they will work with any other cloud provider. So we created a dedicated admin portal for them where they can create and manage their tenants and node groups. So instead of creating a bare cluster in one of the major cloud providers, they can create a tenant and node groups in our internal cluster where they had a lot of additional services and integrations with our internal systems out of the box. And of course, they got a premium support from our engineers who are close to them and who know their pain and who know how they work. So, of course, it's very hard to compete with big cloud guys. But with the help of Capsule, we can be a cloud provider of their choice due to additional value that they will get from working with us. That's all that I wanted to share. Thank you for your time and giving work back to Dario. Okay, welcome back, people. And yeah, it has been really enjoyable. I really enjoyed the presentation by Max because uh, what they achieved at Wargaming is absolutely stunning. I'm really happy that uh, Max helped us also shaping the capsule capabilities and features. And what do you think, Max? Uh, did we do a great job? I think yes, and thank you, Dario, for making capsule available for the world because mostly it is your big achievement and i was just a guest who joined <laughs> in a time yeah yeah probably i had also to share our first um meetings because i recall when you opened the first prs uh, regarding feature requests or also little outpics i recall uh, the most awkward one and it was the broken uh, binary search into the capsule user groups. Do you recall that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was awkward. But anyway, I, I'm really happy because we are shaping a great product. And as I said, also in my presentation, uh, capsule is able to be a framework to build your own multi-tenancy environment on top of Kubernetes. So it's highly non-opinionated. You can do whatever you want. And obviously we are planning further improvements. Um, regarding also the ecosystem, thanks Max, because you shared also the capsule proxy and the capsule proxy is playing a big role into the multi-tenancy because in the end we are using the capsule proxy just to provide the list of the namespaces owned by the tenant. But we got also another project uh, that we had the time to share, and it's the Lens extension. So Lens, it's an IDE developed by Mirantis, and it's really useful because uh, with this IDE, you can, sh you can see all the stuff that is running in your Kubernetes cluster. And there is also the ability to add some extensions. And we at Classics, we developed that uh, with uh, our partner, uh, Nikolai and Adriano. And and it's quite interesting and I'd say that it's really useful. Well, it's not quite, but it's absolutely uh, useful. And take a look to that. And I would like also to um, take the chance to do um, to ask for people if you like Capsule, if you are also considering the multi-tenancy um, topic really interesting, uh, please drop us a call on Twitter, on LinkedIn or GitHub, because we are looking for contributors. And also, if you have feature requests or you are facing some bugs, don't hesitate to open the issues because as I said, um, we are really happy to get feedback from people. So don't be shy. 
Anything else to yeah. add, Max? Or if you just need some help about how to build multi-tenancy, what options you have, you can also join us on the GitHub and we will be glad to help anyone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So don't be shy. Uh, we are looking for you and thanks for all the time attending, attending this call and it has been amazing. And thank you so much. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Goodbye.